Well, good evening. Welcome. We are live. I'm with the one and only, I call him Mr. Mayor, Bill White. He is Houston's 60th mayor, serving from 2004 to 2007. In his 2005 re-election, he received an astounding 91% of the vote. You might remember him too. In 2010, he was a Democratic challenger for governor against the then incumbent, Mr. Rick Perry. I'm very pleased to welcome him here. I thank you very much. We are in the beautiful officers, offices, sorry, of, I almost call it Lazare Frere, but they dropped the Frere. So now it's just Lazare. So thank you very much for being here. It's great to be with you. So, all right, so we will take some of your questions. I see people already logging in. Write them as you go on Facebook. I'll read the comments. Otherwise, we're going to start from his history. We'll go back to his days in San Antonio. We'll talk about being mayor, the best part to be a mayor. And we're not going to handicap. We're going to talk a little bit about the current races and get his, let's say, perspective, maybe some observations from afar, sitting up in the tower. Okay. One thing I want to ask you, because I find it fascinating. Uh, we know he has political bona fides. Do you say that or is it bona fides? I'm know. not sure. You know, I'm Texan, so bona fide. As everyone knows, I'm really a Yankee who moved down to Texas. I don't know what we say up there, but I like to say what you said. That sounds better. Uh, we know he's been a very successful politician and now in the investment banking world. But back in the 1990s, he had amazing credentials as the Deputy Secretary of Energy during the Clinton administration. And I wanted to ask you, uh, did you know the Clintons? I'd met uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, some of us are had sort of, I could call it an interview with some of the presidential candidates back mm -hmm. in 88 and then... Uh, there were there was a issue that really bothered me uh, then, and it bothers me now, which was the deficit. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I'd sort of handicapped early on. I guess this would have been ninety one uh, that we needed a change in the policy on the deficit. You know, President George H. W. Bush had gotten in some trouble trying to short, you know, uh, lower the deficit, and uh, I got to know Bill Clinton personally during that campaign. Did you know Hillary at all? You know, I had met Hillary uh, a couple of times and talked to her, uh, but not as well as her husband. Yeah, back then, the debt. But now it's $22 trillion, Is that right? Yeah. About uh, 22 and a half. Yeah. What was it back in 91, if you remember the number? I can't tell you the exact number, but it was a small fraction, and it was growing, though. I mean, we were running deficits, which is a percentage of the national economy, which were very large and unprecedented during peacetime or a time where we weren't in a severe recession. So then as now, I tend to believe that you ought to get the amount of government you pay for and pay for the amount of government you get. And uh, that's the way that you can strain the growth in government by mm -hmm. putting a price tag on it. And it's also a way that you avoid putting a bill on the future generations. Do you believe we should have a balanced budget amendment? A uh, close question there. I mean, I think we ought to balance the budget. Mm -hmm. The problem with the balanced budget amendment is there's always things that could be done in safeguards where people declare emergencies and the like. Mm -hmm. And if people read my book, America's Fiscal Constitution. We will get there. You will Did see, not forget. You will see that mm -hmm. you could actually have a situation in which uh, the people who want to spend more and the people who want to tax less uh, have a compromise to get around it, and you wind up with a bigger deficit. Uh, so, you know, uh, the constitutional amendment is a clumsy tool, but I do believe there ought to be fundamental changes in congressional budget procedures so that voters can look at every vote, how much is my congressperson voting for to be paid for by taxes and by debt. So you won't have this nonsense of people campaigning that they're for balancing the budget and then governing by appropriating more money than we have tax revenue. Uh, no argument here. Anything we do to reduce spending, get more bang for your buck, I'm all in favor of. Let's go way back. You grew up in San Antonio. I did. Is that where you got your first political start? Uh, really, it wasn't. At the time, it was more like... Um, a movement, you know, San Antonio is a majority Hispanic population. Mm -hmm. 
and there had been some history of, you know, discrimination in our city and uh, within my church and then friends of my dad, you know, got involved basically in the civil rights movement back in the, and it wasn't so much in San Antonio, although there was the issue of racial mm -hmm. segregation, African Americans and, and majority population. Uh, the basic civil rights issue was voting rights uh, for Latinos. So mm -hmm. I was registering voters before I was old enough to vote. Is that where you found the love of politics? Is that your first taste where you said, I'm looking forward to a career in this, I want to be in the public eye, I want to make a difference? Or is it something else? You know, I never really did want a career in politics as such, but I did want to be involved. And, mm -hmm. I didn't want to, and, and when I was a young kid, instead of going to seventh grade during part of the year, I took off and I was a page in the state Senate. And I saw then that decisions that were made, in that case in Austin, did have an impact on people's lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an interesting time in Texas. Uh, and I could see that individuals uh, could make a difference. So after San Antonio, you went to Harvard University, mm -hmm. undergraduate degree, and something very interesting was your roommate at the time. I'm going to read it to make sure I get the name right. Uh, Zulafikar Ali Bhutto. Did I get that right? Yeah, it was his son. Mirmuth is oh, so, yes. Who was, uh, who, so, <laughs> you know, here, here's this kid from San Antonio who had, like, you know, seen snow once in his life mm -hmm. uh, and going to school on American Legion scholarships. Uh, mm -hmm. And I have a roommate from that they are assigned from Pakistan. Uh, and so I learned a little bit. Did you develop any kind of relationship with the prime minister of Pakistan? You know, I, I visited, mm -hmm. actually, when I was a young person, I visited um, in college during a summer uh, Afghanistan. So I saw uh, parts of the world that a lot of people who mm -hmm. uh, didn't see at the time and uh, also got a bit more of an appreciation of, of the Islamic world. I did meet Prime Minister Zilvi Karali Bhutto, uh, but it's not as though we sat around and saw the world's problems together. <laughs> well, now, give or take, what year was this? As I think about the Soviet time and Afghanistan, and of course our time much later than that, but going back into the, the 70s, I don't know the full history, I won't pretend to. No, the history was, I mean, it was at that time, mm -hmm. actually, uh, Prime Minister Bhutto did play a very critical role in uh, uh, U.S. relations and diplomacy. Historically, India had been more or less aligned uh, on uh, military cooperation with the Soviet Union, and the United States was more aligned with Pakistan. And uh, then Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, one of his claims to fame in America was that he sort of brokered, mm -hmm. helped broker a rapprochement between the People's Republic of China. He worked with uh, Kissinger and Nixon uh, to, to begin the process of normalization of relations. Very interesting. All right. So then after Harvard, then you came back here to Texas, became a lawyer. A lot of politicians are lawyers for whatever reason. Not a bad thing. All right, so then you entered into the world of oil and gas from Terra Resources. It's uh, a lot of EMP work over in the Caspian Sea. Uh, did you travel very frequently out to the Caspian Sea, the whole region of the world? Not that much. I did. And uh, step back a second, you know, I'd taken a year off in college mm -hmm. and had at the time, you know, decided to be, you know, in college to study energy. And right when I was in college, the oil embargo hit. The oil embargo, called the Arab oil embargo by some in 1973. And I'm a cause that I had, uh, where some people were protesting the Vietnam War, I was, I was dedicated to making the United States more energy independent. So as a result of that, I spent a lot of time as a lawyer, as a LA on Capitol Hill, first deregulating oil and gas prices or working to deregulate oil and gas prices so that we would have more supply at home. And then uh, energy security was a big concern. So fast forward, mm -hmm. uh, because energy security and diversity of world oil supplies was an important priority uh, during the administration I served, then I traveled a lot to the uh, after the Soviet Union broke up, these various nations uh, that were seeking 
their real economic independence uh, from Russia and spent a lot of time over there dealing with the presidents of countries and trying to create new foreign investment in those countries so that we would have an additional source of world oil supply. And after I left government and, you know, with Dino Nicandros and Lloyd Benson and, and some good oil men, uh, we did make some investments in those com countries as well. So speaking of oil, the price for barrels is rising. Where do you see it going? What's your short term, long term, medium term, whatever you think? Well, anybody who tells you that predicts a price of oil five years from now mm -hmm. is by definition not an expert. <laughs> uh, so, but I would say that uh, my crystal ball has been pretty good in the last few years. Uh, did you so, predict the downturn we had in 2014-15? I, mean, I, I didn't predict the severity of the downturn, but I thought, uh, as when I gave speeches to the fact back in 2014, that uh, <clears throat> that there was more downside to oil pricing, and it wasn't fully priced in the market, and people ought to clean up their balance sheets. Uh, some people did not take that advice. Some but, people got more leverage. Yeah, we won't name any names. Yeah. But I, I think the next couple of years, mm -hmm. uh, you'll see... Uh, supply and demand are in balance in the world right now. If anything, we're going to see a little tightness, so you will see oil prices. I don't expect to see another decline like we saw in 2014 where there was oversupply. I just follow mm -hmm. supp global supply and demand. But as we've seen in the past, there can be additional sources of supply. There can be geopolitical disruptions. Mm -hmm. If Venezuelan workers all go on strike, uh, and that production comes offline, you could see a spike in oil prices. If China goes into a recession, you could see a decline. Do you think Iran will be a, a world prognosticator? Well, I mean, that's the wrong word here. Do you think the political turmoil in Iran will have a strong effect on oil going forward? Or is all that risk already built into the market price today? A fair amount of it is built into the market price today, and it's less turmoil uh, than... You know, people read the headline news and mm -hmm. the president does this and there's sanctions imposed on this. But the big, one of the biggest impediments uh, to reviving the uh, oil industry in Iran is uh, the laws and lack of laws and, and uh, the political framework in Iran itself. Uh, many countries are very suspicious of foreign direct investment. They try to raise taxes, they're afraid of being taken advantage of, and they put many different barriers to foreign investment. Um, I'll just say the reason that the United States is such a world leader in oil supply is not because, you know, more dinosaurs died under Texas, but it's because we have a system of laws and predictability and predictable taxation and private property mm -hmm. uh, where uh, there are more incentives to drill. I would say it's summed up in property rights. Pretty simple. With property rights, you have uh, motivation. You have incentive to capitalize any kind of resources you own or to go out, obtain property, and exploit it. Very much the same page. Okay, so then you became the CEO of the Wedge Group. Did I get the, the exactly. timing correctly? Okay. That must have been quite an experience. It was a growing company back then, right? It was, it was smaller than it is today, I believe. Yeah. And so you, how long were you there for? Uh, seven years, and uh, we invested in a lot of Texas companies, energy companies mainly, uh, people who provided services to the energy industry, people who upgraded refineries so that they would make cleaner fuels uh, and real estate. But uh, I enjoyed the, my time in business. And, you know, uh, some of the skills and tools that I took from a business career is what I did when I became mayor. That's the best type of politician, isn't it? Someone with business experience. I tweet that all the time. I have to. All right. So when you were, he was on the board of directors of the North American Electricity Reliability Council. And I just thought of this a few moments ago. I wanted to ask you, um, is the electricity grid in America in danger of an EMP attack? Are we prepared? Let's, let me rephrase the question. Well, I'll start with this, uh, that there are hundreds of thousands of, uh, uh, you know, cyber attacks mm -hmm. on the grid uh, and in uh, and, and every grid. So are there cyber attacks? There's mass amounts of cyber attacks. 
after, you know, that guy Snowden, Snowden you know, revealed so much of our national security mm -hmm. uh, classified information, the attacks increased mm -hmm. uh, on infrastructure. There is uh, a lot of investment to protect that infrastructure as well. So uh, would I say there's vulnerabilities? Yes, there are vulnerabilities, uh, but uh, there's a lot of investment going in to try to make it less vulnerable. Let's do a little segue. Let's talk about, and by the way, I see people are, are writing on the screen there. If you have questions, just shout it out or we'll read it off. Let's talk about being the mayor. All right, so your first election, uh, you defeated our now current mayor, Sylvester Turner. I uh, mean, he made the runoff against Orlando Sanchez, and he went up winning with 63% of the vote. I was curious about the relationship in a mayoral race between the candidates. Is it is it very friendly? Does it continue to be friendly? Is it more, uh, let's say, combative or antagonistic? And every race is different. But I was curious what, at this level, what your thoughts? Well, uh, it was pretty friendly uh, with the candidates in that race. Uh, for one thing, uh, you know, I never ran any negative ads, uh, so that it's a lot more, easier to like you. Yeah, you're not attacking it's you. Easy, easier, but mm -hmm. but more than that, I mean, we were. I participated in it every time that anybody invited to a candidate forum. I accepted because I was sort of an unknown, and both of these fellows had run for mayor before and mm -hmm. had almost won, and so they were well known at the outside. So I figured I better get out there and you know let people know who I was, and there were over 90 different what are called joint candidate forums where all the candidates were invited and not all of them showed up but i always showed up how small and, was the smallest one uh <laughs> there was a candidate forum with about five people five there. yep <laughs> and so you know one of the opponents uh didn't make it but uh usually they were larger than that but sometimes there were you know 30 or 40 people there mm -hmm. and if you do that, you spend a lot of time with people, uh, and so much so that Sylvester and I could practically, mm -hmm. you know, give each other's punchlines and positions. So you, you get to know people pretty well. It's funny because in my race, we did the same, not 90, but we probably had 20 candidate forms and I used to do impressions of everybody because you get the same you hear the same speeches over and over again and I always made it a goal to never repeat the same speech because it gets boring not just for the people attend but you said one time there were five people I we've had them where let's say all the candidates brought two people you know members of their staff and then there's four people in the audience like four actual real voters and it's just a whole whole bus full of all us will come up and you have the same same debates same questions and i get that all right um let's start with the first term the metro light rail uh we know it pretty well now in houston it's, it's been greatly expanded for the last i guess 13 years now what was the grand vision when you first started it well uh you know it, it really wasn't my vision. I think there were people, you know, the rail debate's been going on in Houston for a long time. Now it's high and, speed rail too. And, and the you know, original vision was that it would be a mass transportation option mm -hmm. that would take, that would relieve a lot of the freeway congestion, et cetera. I never found that to be all that plausible. Um, I guess you'd call it that I, I've been there's some people that are anti-rail as a matter of theology, pro-rail as a matter of theology. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a little bit more practical. I think that the light rail system is more or less like, um, you know, major thoroughfare development where you build this facility. And then if you look at the experience of other cities, there's development that occurs around the rail corridor. It takes a while. It usually takes about a generation. But it's another option. Uh, as we get, grow, where there can be uh, more people without having to constantly, you know, expand the streets and freeways. At the scale that it's currently at, it doesn't put much of a dent in the commute time, uh, but it is uh, an amenity that's an important part of the transportation mix. Was it ever looked at to extend from the suburbs or from IAH? from Katy or from the Woodlands to connect that far, like a, like a Long Island Railroad like a commuter or rail a system. real giant commuter rail system. Was I, it ever conceived? Yeah, I mean, there was uh, 
you know, still to this day, I believe, and I urge Metro to take a look at that if you built a, what you would call commuter or heavy rail line from Fort Bend County down to the current light rail at, at Fannin, that that's where you see, where you really see rail used effectively mm -hmm. is where it goes from where people work, uh, live to where they work, and it's a commuter rail. And so uh, that type of system and that particular location, you have a large number of people who are commuting from Fort Bend County in the southwest in towards the medical center area. I think that could be effective in that location. Was there, was there anyone pushing for that from the airports? So we're up in the Kingwood area, all the way from Kingwood, to try to alleviate that I-45, I-59, I-10, and maybe put a rail system that runs along the highway. Does that ever come up? Yes, it has, and you know the. Uh, but then there are always a question of cost and mm -hmm. uh, who's going to pay for it. So, uh, for Kingwood and the Woodlands, uh, there is metro service, and you know those buses uh, and the HOV lanes are doing a pretty good job of moving a lot of people and relieving congestion. And that's probably a cheaper alternative than a fixed rail alternative. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, former mayor, Bob Lanier, sort of made a name of being anti-rail uh, when he chaired Metro. But, you know, uh, in his last decade, he looked back and, 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 and regretted that we did lose that rail right away that paralleled the Katy Freeway. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be, that and the one that parallels 290 could be potential commuter rail. That could have solved a lot of trouble, all those people sitting in traffic. To go one mile for an hour on that I-10, I don't, I don't envy you. Uh, Discovery Green, it's one of my favorite places in all of Houston. Uh, we take our son there all the time, so we are thankful that you were the driving force behind getting that completed. So do we need more? And I'm going to call this a grand park. Do we need more grand parks in the city of Houston? Well, uh, let me just say, as a Houston patriot, that we're pretty in pretty good shape compared to other cities mm -hmm. with Memorial Park, Herman Park, Discovery Green, McGregor Park. Uh, so we have some large regional parks and, and the parks to the west side uh, <coughs> are wonderful amenities. And there's not many big cities that have that amount of park space. Uh, Memorial Park, for example, is one of the most used parks in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. But could we use more? Yes. Uh, but then there's always a trade off the question of cost. Uh, so, you know, what we did with Discovery Green, what I did there was uh, a lot of it was paid for by private contributions I helped to raise. And uh, boy, was that a good, in and we did have a public contribution, but was that a good investment on the, on the tax dollar? Because with, uh, you know, about a, call it a $40 million public investment, probably a little less than that, actually, there was in short order about two billion dollars of mm -hmm. development right around the periphery of the park and the taxes from that development within about a year <laughs> paid for the public investment right. of the park so i think you know in in uh, private real estate development there's a model called golf course development you have a golf course in the middle and then you make the money by selling the, selling last the houses are worth something yes not every golf course is successful and so you can't say, well, we're just going to do this 10 times over. But uh, it is a type of model for development. And, uh, you know, we attracted large amounts of private philanthropy. And now we have uh, some of the nicest hotels in Houston surrounding and a new convention center. Uh, so thank you for the park. We love it down there. All right. Let's switch over to red light cameras. It's been a very controversial thing, but do they work in saving lives? What do you think? Yes. I mean, people uh, stop at red lights more when they think they're going to get caught. Well said. Uh, does it increase our quality of living? Or do people slam that brakes and cause more accidents, whatever else it might be? Uh, it, you know, what the experience in other cities mm -hmm. and some study by Rice University showed that it improves safety. And, uh, you know, if we have red lights, people would stop at red lights. And they ought to, you know, people are creatures of habit. And uh, I had too many citizens while I was on the campaign trail who told me stories of uh, some gruesome accidents where people were speeding through red lights. And this looked like a way that 
you hold drivers more accountable without having the to incur the expense of having we can never it'd be in, extraordinarily expensive to have police officers at every intersection is this a partisan question no do you think that that ever lies on i don't know the answer uh, i always wondered is it uh, i feel so i'm not saying it's true or it feels like maybe the right is more opposed to it because they say it's because of privacy concerns and i it, sure. it was it was a it was a mm -hmm. strange coalition of people, uh, uh, so, and you could say is both on the right and the left. There were some, uh, there were some people who were, I mean, I did a fair amount of polling on it, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, some of the opposition was from, in some neighborhoods, low income neighborhoods, largely minority neighborhoods. There was a feeling that. Big Brother was spying on him, uh, but whether that I don't know whether that's left wing or right wing. I mean, uh, but you know, and the ACLU opposed it. But a lot of the funding came from the uh, criminal defense lawyers who, who you know, defend people who get tickets and wait for the officer not to show up. Uh, the with red light cameras that doesn't occur. I like that. Uh, what was the most surprising aspect of being mayor? The thing you never anticipated to be true. You know, I sort of had heard about it, and uh, mayors who I talked to after my election sort of warned me about this. But if you're in the news every day and on local TV almost every day, mm -hmm. then, you know, people may not know who be able to name both their senators. I've seen polls where, you know, 30% of the people didn't know who the vice president was, mm -hmm. but they know who the mayor is and they know who the president is. So the almost complete lack of, I guess you'd call it privacy. You go out uh, to dinner with your spouse mm -hmm. and uh, you know, there would be people wanting to talk about what was happening in their, in their neighborhood or, you know, watching what you eat. So, you know, I got to <laughs> have good table manners and all that, but that, that being in that bubble uh, was new to me. Is it? Is it still the case now, ten years later? Oh, sometimes, but it, it you know it wears off over time. They don't come, now. They come over to say hello, but they don't come over with their problems. I would they imagine. don't come over their problems, That's right. and and they say something like, uh, "I know who you are. Are you a TV star?" They they can't they put can't put the name with the face, but but they know that they've seen me somewhere. Uh, people recognize me for various things, but they think I'm somebody else every single time. Never who I actually am, not once. Uh, the other weekend, my wife and I, we walked with uh, the Crenshaws through Minute Maid Park. And every every three feet, uh, somebody would stop him and take a picture and shake his hand. And, and I'm very happy for him. But my thought was, wow, he really, um, his life is completely different now. He has no more anonymity, Dan Crenshaw. I mean, it's... Uh, and which isn't necessarily a bad thing at all, but it's just it just must be interesting. A few short months ago, he's just another guy, and now he can't walk 10 feet. Yeah, my friend Jim Baker tells a story when he, he ran for attorney general before becoming mm -hmm. secretary of state and the like, where he, he had all these TV ads, and he had been a lawyer and behind the scenes, just like me, uh, uh, behind the scenes in politics, and then had all these TV ads, and he was in Lubbock, uh, and somebody came up to him and said, you know, uh, did, has anybody ever told you you look like that guy, Jim Baker, mm -hmm. who's on TV? He says, well, yes, I did. And the fellow said, doesn't that just piss you off? <laughs> I've heard this story before, too. Every time I hear it, I think it's funny. <laughs> it was funny. That was the last campaign he ran in, right, right. for That's himself. Right. Last time he put his name on the ballot. Uh, what was the best part of being mayor? Getting things done. I mean, you know, uh, I, there's things, you know, we have a strong mayor form of government, the strongest mm -hmm. strong mayor form of government in the country. And when you could see uh, that you could, you know, fix a problem or some city rule regulation didn't make sense uh, and you can make a phone call and stop it and improve somebody's life, uh, that was extremely satisfying to me. Uh, and, and also, uh, I mean, this was not in a sense, a, a highlight, but it was, uh, 
you know, whenever a city employee mm -hmm. was injured, then I was there at the hospital. And uh, 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 being able to let the people who were hardworking policemen, firefighters, we had public works employees, uh, they got hurt because people would, you know, be they'd be putting out cones and somebody would hit them. Uh, and uh, being able to, to express appreciation on behalf of the people of Houston mm -hmm. uh, to those people for their service, that was very rewarding. What would you offer as advice for the next mayor? So the first day of being a mayor, you say, here's what I'd suggest. What do you think? I think the most important job of a mayor of a big city, and frankly, this is leadership, is to find common ground because the more common ground you can find, the easier it is to get things done. Uh, so, you know, for example, I dealt with the leadership of the faith community. I'm a Christian. I, you know, I taught Sunday school and I feel comfortable, but there's many different faiths. And uh, before taking some of our initiatives to clean the air, it's not anti-business. I mean, nobody should have the right to put carcinogens in the air that somebody else breathes. Uh, then we were able to build a broad consensus. Uh, and it is, you know, we're a diverse city. And leadership, not advocacy, leadership is finding common ground on things that people care about so you can get things done. We'll switch over to some current issues. I want to ask you property taxes. You cut taxes back in 2006. Are property taxes today, are they too high? You know, I'm not enough in the weeds of the budget mm -hmm. uh, to tell you uh, exactly what the right level of taxation should be. Basically, my approach, I may, I mean, I may be the only politician that I've ever heard of who during the campaign said, uh, to this answer the same question that uh, I don't want to spend a dollar more than we have to and I got to look under the hood and see what efficiencies we can find uh, where the needs are and if there's anything that we can cut and uh, balance that against the revenues that we need so I didn't uh, promise to cut taxes but uh, I raise a senior exemption substantially and then, you know, uh, cut taxes uh, several times, actually, during my administration. Cut what, the tax rate. Which is a great segue. I want to talk about your book, America's Fiscal Constitution. It's triumph and collapse. Did I get those words right? Right? There you go. There we go. All right, in your own words, why is a national debt a cause for concern? Um. Uh, a national debt is a cause for concern because you're mortgaging future tax revenues. It should be a concern for people who believe, or progressive people who believe in a, uh, a social safety net because that's not sustainable unless you have a sustainable source of revenues. It should be troubling for uh, people who believe in small government, more conservatives, because conservatives in the past realized that unless you put a price sticker that people had to pay on government, if you just paid for it with debt, government would expand more. It's just like anything else. If, if you tell somebody, hey, you get, you know, uh, you get, you don't have to pay for two years for your car. You're, you do that to sell more cars. Uh, so, uh, and, and the problem is that the more the debt mounts, then in the future, a greater portion of every tax dollar has to be spent on benefits that were obtained in the past mm -hmm. and less is, is, is available to spend without even more deficit spending on the, for the people who are paying taxes at the time. Uh, America is based on the idea that every generation should have more opportunities than the last generation. And that's why, and my book documents, from the founding of the country up until, you know, sometime close to, you know, post-2000, uh, every leader of every major party would have been sort of kicked out if they didn't aim for a balanced budget, mm -hmm. except in extraordinary and well-defined circumstances. War, severe economic downturns, 
to acquire territory, the Louisiana Purchase, and to connect territory, Panama Canal, the Union Pacific Railway. That's the only reason that we borrowed. Those four reasons, the only time the federal government borrowed for almost 180 years. That's because the federal government changed the scope so dramatically. I mean, you look at our, our social programs that exist today, you compare that to 100 years ago or 150 years ago. It's a well, completely black and white. Yeah, I, I would say with due respect, uh, you know, Judson, uh, there was a bit of a turning point uh, that occurred in 2001 and uh, where we had a balanced budget in 2000. And I was part of, I, I cut the budget. I cut budgets in the Department of Energy to do it. I think the nation does, you know, owes Ross Pro in 1992 a debt of gratitude because he really brought this issue to the forefront with his insurgent candidacy. And both President Clinton and Newt Gingrich felt that it was important uh, to balance budget. But uh, Clinton so that, didn't balance the budget in 92, 93. Isn't that why he lost the House of Representatives in 94 to Gingrich? No, I think he, he, he lost it because for a variety of reasons, but people thought he was more centrist, and there was a bit of a, a – I think that the health care plan and a few other things that he did uh, probably resulted in a little bit of a pushback there. But I, I think that that's not the reason that he lost. But it is uh, one reason why, uh, you know, Gingrich was dead set on uh, trying to get a balanced budget. And the president, um, it's all documented in the book, uh, had an alternative plan to balance the budget and they battled it out. Uh, but the same is true with Truman and Taft back after, this is ancient history, but after World War II, uh, there were no two more stronger partisans and more articulated conservative, you know, articulate conservative than Robert Taft of Ohio. And Harry Truman was died in the wool Democrat who believed in a, a larger government safety net. But the two were on the same plane that they weren't going to borrow a dime uh, to pay for government. So that the government would be now after after 2001 was the first time that we expanded a major mm -hmm. entitlement program uh, without uh, which is a Medicaid Medicare Part D without any revenue source. It's the first time that we cut taxes as opposed to raise taxes during wars. We'd all, all, always raise taxes during wars uh, before that time. Uh, so this was. Uh, the post-2000, where you say Bush, Obama, Trump, their fiscal policies mm -hmm. are much cl more closely, are much closer together than the fiscal policies of prior presidents in, in either party. Mm -hmm. and, and that is that where you use debt to fund recurring operating expenses of the government as opposed to emergencies. That's where I think we're going down the wrong road. I fully agree. We need to pay off the debt. See, we agree 100%. Uh, I wish in 2008 when Obama said, I will cut the national debt in half. I believe it was $8 trillion. Is that right? $8 trillion at the time? And uh, he doubled it. And I hope that, that Trump will look at this as a priority and cut the debt in half or, and try to eliminate it as much as humanly possible. You're right, because it's our, it's our children's future. It's our grandkids' future, and you're absolutely right. Each dollar that we borrow today must be paid back later with interest. Yeah, and, and but I only just tell you, mm -hmm. uh, you document in the book, and this is not this is a factual statement, not a partisan statement. I'm just telling a fact mm -hmm. uh, that there was routine spending def and deliberate deficit spending, which resulted in a great increase in the debt during the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration, Obama administration, and now in the Trump administration. And uh, I, I think that we need, we need to get back on course. Do we need term limits in Congress, the U.S. Congress, like we do have for here in Houston, for mayor? You know, there is a type of term limit, and that's when people vote incumbents out. And uh, there is something to be said about retaining institutional memory because if you have too many newcomers, mm -hmm. then the call it career bureaucracy is in control. It takes people with knowledge. On the other hand, I think that there's a lot of people who stayed in Congress too long. How long does somebody need to be in Washington? 
before they can figure it out so the staff isn't running the show? It depends in part on what their preparation is. And uh, it's very unique to, but, you know, each individual. But I there, are, there are talent, talented members of Congress <laughs> who, you know, mm -hmm. four, six, to eight years, if people have had some political service or they, you know, pay a lot of attention to their committee work, it, within a few years, they can have an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does it does take a little while. What about this? Here's the plan. Uh, you have 12 years in Congress. It'd be six-term House, two-term Senate, or a combination. That's enough time to figure the job out, if you will. It's enough time to build influence. It's enough time to get things done. 12 years. Does that make sense? You know, I, well, I think it makes sense as a guide to voters and asking themselves, you know, is it time for a change? Uh, but again, I, I'd be reluctant to uh, put hard and fast rules because uh, uh, there are people who are who, who are really get up to speed and you need some institutional memory there. Eric, I see your question there. We will get to that one. Let me go to my favorite spot. We're going to talk about the current races right now. I'm going to give a handicap. I do every single time. Uh, Bill's going to agree or disagree. Is that fair? Maybe a thumbs up, thumbs down, or you know, give me a whatever you want, right? He's not going to give you the number. So, all right, the first one, Governor Abbott versus Lupe Valdez. I say Abbott wins by 24. You don't have to agree or disagree, but I want to ask with Andrew White losing in the in the primary, do you think that makes a statement about the Democratic Party in Texas today? Uh, not really. I mean, the fact that you know Andrew could come out of nowhere, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, says that uh, uh, you know there's plenty of room in the Democratic Party for for newcomers and people with business experience. Uh, but, you know, on the race, uh, you know, the governor has amassed this massive, massive war chest mm -hmm. and is a lot more well known than uh, uh, Sheriff Valdez. So you'd have to handicap him as a favor. But the uh, question is going to be, and the thing that people should look at is, you know, what do the margins look like in these statewide races? Okay. Uh, the big race. They are incumbent, Senator Ted Cruz versus Robert Francis O'Rourke. Uh, I say Ted wins by six, and it's uh, moving this upwards a little bit because I look at the last week in Washington, all the hysteria, whatever you want to call it, all, all the theatrics, and I think that's galvanized a whole base of the Republican Party throughout the state and throughout the nation and said we are going to make a statement and we're not going to sit at home come November, we're going to come out and vote. And I think that's going to drive a higher turnout than expected for the Republicans. Although I know the Democrats have a huge enthusiasm number behind them too. It'll be a very well uh, participated 2018. So I say cruise by six. Any any feedback, observations? Hey, you know, uh, this may be in the category of uh, <coughs> very interesting and, and could be too close to call. I mean, there's still a uh, greater voter identification with the Republican Party in the state of Texas, mm -hmm. purple self-identification of voter, and still somewhat higher turnout uh, in most off-year elections. But we saw in 2006 when people, you know, were wondering about whether, you know, had we really won the war in Iraq and uh, was privatization of Social Security such a good idea and, mm -hmm. and had people, you know, the deficit had been increasing a lot. And that year you saw uh, amazed a lot of people, including me, uh, mm -hmm. you had down ballot Democrats come within a few percentage of uh, 50% uh, who had no budgets and no name ID. So I, it, it, elections in the United States are, are becoming much more nationalized. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that's a good thing. Uh, I think people ought to vote for governor who would run the state best. I think they ought to you know, but they're becoming much more nationalized. And uh, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. A good comment just came in. A good compliment for you. Uh, Dr. David Branham, he's the department chair at U of H downtown. And he said he will assign your book to his class. 
Well, thank you. There's I, a compliment, I, 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 I right? I appreciate it. I appreciate There's it. There's a compliment. Uh, all right, my favorite race, uh, our friend, Lieutenant Commander Dan Crenshaw versus Todd the Kitten Litton. First, what do you think of that name? It's, I heard it's been catching on. Todd the Kitten Litton. I think it's kind of complimentary. I don't, I don't know. You haven't heard it? No. Oh. What do you think? Okay, well, I'll give you my prediction first. Hold yeah. on. I'll, I'll be fair. Uh, Dan wins by 14. You know, I, I think uh, this is a Republican-leaning district. Mm -hmm. uh, Strong Todd, arm. Yeah. Uh, uh, Todd is a mainstream candidate, but he has he's fighting against, uh, you know, it, it's all a matter of if somebody wants to send a message uh, about President Trump. I think that's what the race is about. You're right. That's that's the wrong way to do an election for your representative. It should be about the person and their policies and their ideals and their character and what they'll do. Fully agree. Uh, CD29 with Gene Green retiring. So we have uh, Philip Aronoff, a good friend, versus Sylvia Garcia, the state senator. She's a state senator, right? State senator. State senator. Right. Sylvia Garcia. Uh, this one is two. I want to spin a coin. I say Philip by one. I think... Uh... We may disagree Silly again. By a significant margin. <laughs> so far, we haven't agreed on yeah, any of them. Yeah. Okay, uh, and the big one here, CD seven, the incumbent, Mr. John Culberson versus uh, Lizzie Fletcher. Okay, I'm going to go out and say Culberson wins also by six points. Uh, I still think it's a Republican district. I look at the numbers of who voted in the March primary between the Republicans and the Democrats. More Republicans voted. And it wasn't a huge contest. All that momentum, all that money and news, New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, everybody's in CD7. But yet somehow more Republicans still voted. So I say Culberson by seven. What do you say? Six. I, I, th I, think, it's a, I think this one, uh, most people think, I mean, I haven't done any, I haven't looked at any polling, just mm -hmm. my instinct, because it's going to be a close race. Uh, uh, you know, John Culberson is a talented campaigner, but... He's been, you know, he's been in Washington for a little while, and uh, I think there's widespread dissatisfaction with incumbents uh, in Washington. So uh, I think, you know, uh, take a look at this race. It, I think this, I think you're right. It's going to be one that a lot of people watch. So who wins the House? Which party? You know, I have no, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I read stories about, and and I have friend, I have many close friends who mm -hmm. uh, are, uh, you know, very strong supporters of uh, the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee and the like, and, mm -hmm. and they're not very optimistic about the House right now. I hope their enthusiasm isn't too contagious. Uh, so will you run again? Any plans? What do you want to put your name on the ballot? U.S. Senator. I have no plans. No plans. If they called you and said, Mr. Mayor, we need you. Would you consider it? Who is this? I don't know. Whoever you tell, yeah, that's not the you way tell it works me. <laughs> in the United States, I mean, there may be some people who say they had a dream, or yeah. you know, they uh, they heard a voice from a high, or, but uh, you know, look, uh, I am who I am. I'm, I'm, I think I'm pretty good at governing, mm -hmm. but I don't like all the show business and exaggeration uh, that you see in some of these races that are TV image type races. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it is just, uh, you know, here in Houston, uh, people, are, you know, manage the city in a pretty bipartisan fashion, have a partisan preference uh, generally, but uh, even, you know, going down, uh, I don't vote always straight ticket on judicial races or anything. I try to find who the most qualified person is. Uh, in Texas, we have a lot of straight ticket voting, a lot of nationalization. And, and uh, you know, sometimes people want really simple answers to complex questions. And I'm going to give the right answer. Does that mean you would support, well, it's already going to happen, 2020, when we eliminate the straight ticket voting? Is that a good thing in your point of view? Yeah, I agree. I agree. We're looking forward to that. Uh, Eric asked a good question here, and he said, why would you come on as a well-known Democrat to come on the Republicans of Houston page? 
uh, because I was invited. I mean, you know. Fair answer. Was, That's good enough, right? I like that. Okay. Any, uh, you want to talk about Lazare? Um, you know, I'm back in business and the in. energy business, and uh, uh, it gives you a, a global perspective. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, our business is the oldest and largest global financial advisory firm. And so we advise governments and companies. And, uh, you know, I'm glad to be back in business because one thing in business is you tend to be more uh, judged on results. Uh, and, than image. Uh, well said. Than, than image. And, and I thank the people of Houston for judging me for that uh, and, and uh, uh, for the city of Houston. And I think that's what we ought to look at our political leaders more for. We have too many advocates and few, too few people who are focused on concrete, tangible results. Well said. Well said. See, there's a lot we have in common between the Republicans of Houston and our former Democratic mayor. All right, you have upcoming plugs, places you'll be, speeches, TV appearances, anything? No, not really. I mean, you know, they, it would be, uh, I, it's going to be an interesting, my wife is co-chairing something that's mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, the, the Baker Institute at Rice University uh, is uh, celebrating its 25th anniversary. Mm -hmm members of the Bush family and in you know, a much of our business community, oil and gas executives are supporting it. Uh, and uh, Secretary Baker has asked for a special guest speaker. Uh, I think General Powell is the is honorary co-chair, which is uh, President Obama. So it'll be interesting now that people, you know, I listen to all former presidents. Once they've gotten out of office, they've usually gotten some of the, you know, they're not running for office anymore. And especially their perspectives on foreign policy and how we're perceived in the world, position in the world, I always think it's interesting to listen to. Speaking of the Rice uh, Baker Institute, Mitt Romney will be there coming up. Uh, has he been already? Do you follow? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, Mitt, I think we'll be here in a couple weeks. Uh, we saw John Kasich there a couple months ago, too. There's a lot of good speakers there. there um, all right. Any other speeches events any other plugs no no plugs, plugs? oh yeah. plugs are the most fun uh all right this friday i'll be back in ann arbor this is the big one i'll be speaking on campus at michigan can you believe that they invited me back yeah i wear my michigan t-shirt give a speech uh and then monday we are doing the lake houston packet room club we're having conversation with our candidate dan crenshaw it will be uh some i don't know some beautiful dinner at amadeo's we'll have a Q&A, we'll have some speeches. It'll be fun. I'm probably underselling this one because all I do is think about today and Friday. All right, any other last minute things to throw in there before we say goodnight to everybody? No, thanks you for having us and uh, uh, thanks folks for watching. And uh, I hope that uh, regardless of you know, your political views and political affiliations, uh, I like, we're going to be a better country if people are active citizens, if they seek diverse sources of news, if they look critically at candidates and who they are and their personal background, if they look for people with real achievement in their life who are seeking public office, and if you find a candidate you believe in, uh, then go out and do some work for that candidate. Our country will be stronger for it. That is well said. I could have never said better myself. That's fantastic. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching.